Hey, you guys, Scott Horton here to remind you that it's fun drive time at the Institute right now. We only do this twice a year, but it's got to be done. And I'm proud to do it, too. We've got an incredible crew of the best writers, authors, and podcasters in the libertarian movement. From Jim Bovard, Lori Calhoun, Tom Woods, and Ted Carpenter, to Keith Knight, Kyle Anzalone, Hunter Dorensis, Connor Freeman, and all the rest of the guys. It's the best team around. We've published three books this year. Keith Knight's Voluntarist Handbook, Lori Calhoun's Questioning the COVID Company Line, and Joseph Solis Mullins, The Fake China Threat. And here any day now, we will be publishing Thomas E. Wood's Diary of a Psychosis, Jim Bovard's Last Rites, and Keith Knight's latest, Domestic Imperialism. That makes 13 books so far, with more coming in the new year, including my new one, Provoked, How Washington Started the New Cold War with Russia and the Catastrophe in Ukraine, which, I know, is already overlong and overdue, but I'm working on it, I promise. And which brings me to the point, we don't have a big glass office building in downtown Washington. The money we raise goes straight to payroll and book production costs, and that's about it. The Libertarian Institute is the best bang for your buck in the movement. If you believe in what we're doing, please go to libertarianinstitute.org slash donate for details on how you can help keep us going into the new year and the great kickbacks we offer as well. And we thank you for your support. All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey guys, on the line, I've got Trita Parsi, and he used to be with the National American Iranian Council. Now he's the co-founder and the president or vice president or one of those important things at Responsible Statecraft. That's the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, Great group of our friends is who it is writing over there at Responsible Statecraft. And he wrote a bunch of books, but especially he wrote Treacherous Alliance, which is one of the most important books about American foreign policy, Middle East policy, certainly, that you could ever read. Welcome back to the show, Trita. How you doing? Doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to have you here. Um, listen, I've been seeing on Twitter that you're keeping very close tabs on developments uh, going on in the Gaza Strip there. So, I think I want to start with that, the reality of the humanitarian situation for people who maybe are only kind of sort of keeping up with it or don't really know. They're maybe waiting for some secondhand information about just what exactly is happening there. Could you give us a good thumbnail? It's a complete disaster. I mean, just today you had on uh, Amanpour and CNN the UN relief chief, Martin Griffins, saying that this is the worst thing he's ever seen. And that includes the work he did uh, uh, in Cambodia with the Khmer Rouge at the killing fields. I know, I saw that. So it tells you something, you know, it, this is, and he, he says it, uh, he says that I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here. I'm not trying to exaggerate. This is the worst he's ever seen. And if you just take a look at the numbers, 68% of the killed are women or children. Yeah. And that's what he meant, have, by the way. I mean, the, the raw numbers in Cambodia are in the millions, but he was talking about how it's the women. And I think specifically he meant there, it's the 68% of the, I think, did he say dead or of the overall casualties are women and children? Dead. He said of the dead of are the dead. women and mm-hmm. children. And that's um, just incredible. When you compare that to other conflicts, we had about 600 to 700 dead children in Ukraine over the course of 20 months. We have more than 5,000 dead children in Gaza in the course of six weeks. The pace is just unparalleled. Every day between 150 and 180 children are killed. That was around 10 to 20 at most in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Afghanistan. So the part of the reason why you see people being so angry and upset is precisely because of these numbers. This is 
in terms of proportion, unlike anything we have seen. It's, you know, it's just a killing machine of children. And so many of them are dying the worst possible deaths because they're asleep and their building gets hit by a bomb by Israel and they are all crushed to death. So there's a very large number of dead people that we haven't identified yet. So when the Gaza health authorities say that it is about what 14,000 at this point, and some people here question that, the Israelis themselves three weeks ago said that they estimated that they had killed about 20,000 people because right. so many are crushed on the buildings and have not been identified yet. Yeah, well, and you know, crushed to death is just also another way of saying buried alive too. And you know, I've seen this from some of the pictures from the craters, you know, the bomb blasts and the aftermath. And there was one last week where all you can see is the guy's legs sticking straight out of the ground. And he's just yeah. buried alive that way. There's no way. And they're trying to dig for him, but there's no way they're going to get him out of there in time. He's buried up to his yeah. knees. And yeah. just this is and, what's and, happening. And then to when you look at that, that proportion and Israeli numbers themselves that their officials have in interviews given, not necessarily in statements. I mean, we're talking about them identifying uh, a couple of dozen Hamas officials that they believe have been killed in all of this. So the number of civilians being killed compared to Hamas fighters is just absolutely ridiculous and incomparable to what we have seen in other wars. Yeah, I mean, they know that the Hamas and, guys are hiding underground while they're bombing these buildings full of people they know are civilians, right? Exactly. If, if this was really about going after Hamas, it would have made more sense from the Israeli standpoint, given their patterns in the past. I mean, the Israelis have uh, are the ones that have conducted more assassinations outside of Israel than any other country. In fact, much of the rules of engagement there have been established by the Israelis and then later on adopted by the United States. If they were really going after Hamas, that would have probably been far more effective than what they're doing right now. If they're trying to destroy Gaza and make it uninhabitable and get rid of 2.3 million Palestinians and shove them into Egypt and other countries, which their own interior minister just said on Israeli TV yesterday as that being the plan or as that should be the plan. Well, then this strategy perhaps uh, makes sense. But why is the United States signing on off on such a strategy? Remember, Biden attended the war cabinet when the plans were uh, designed for this war. This is not something that the United States or the Biden administration can claim any type of plausible deniability for. No, certainly not. I mean, they're shipping weapons there all the time. Um, and now, so listen, Trita, I mean, the thing is, nobody wants to go out on a limb and be too alarmist and look like a jerk later. Maybe some people don't care, but, you know, I feel like I don't want to just say it's clear they are going to cleanse the entire strip and it's a genocide and it must be stopped on that basis because, you know what, it's sort of a little bit speculative and a little bit deniable. No, we're just going after Hamas, they say. And yet, they also keep leaking all these trial balloons about, you know, actually, you ought to take them. Or let's push them into the Sinai. Or let's push them, you know, elsewhere into Egypt or into Jordan or who knows where. And so, is it safe to say now that, no, look, this is a genocide. They're clearly cleansing the Strip. They're going to keep at least, what, the northern half of it clear of... Palestinians and refuse to allow them to come back and it should the policy must be opposed on that basis or no we're still too afraid to go all the way out on that limb because we still don't exactly know that for sure or you say things so uh, on the issue of uh, a genocide we have plenty of legal scholars who have come out and, and declare that this does meet the standards for a, a genocide and a critical component of that of course is the declaration of intent which again, over and over and over again, has been provided by Israeli officials. But even if you want to disagree with that assessment, bottom line is, in my view, the number of deaths, the proportion of civilians, the complete inefficiency of actually going after Hamas, the clear lesson from all previous examples from Israel's own invasion of Lebanon in 1982, previous uh, attacks against Gaza, the US experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. shows 
you still cannot win this militarily. For every civilian killed, you're probably producing three more Hamas recruits. So that in and of itself should be sufficient to have the United States press for a ceasefire, uh, even if we just set aside definitions of genocide, etc. Moreover, another factor that I think should be absolutely crucial in the American consideration is that the longer this goes on, the higher the risk that American troops are going to get killed by an attack by Iraqi or Syrian militias, and the United States is going to get dragged into yet another war in the Middle East. On October 26, there was an attack by an Iraqi militia against the Erbil Air Base in northern Iraq. The drone managed to get through the American air defenses. It hit the barracks on the second floor, 5 a.m. in the morning, but out of pure luck, the explosives on the drone did not explode. Had it exploded, probably two dozen American soldiers would have been killed in their sleep. There would have been massive pressure on the Biden administration to strike, not just Iraqi militias, but probably Iran as well. Uh, and much indicates that Biden would not have been able to withstand that pressure. And we would have been at a full scale war in the Middle East. Now there's been 62 attacks against American bases since October 7th. As point of comparison, between January 2021, when Biden took office, and March 2023, there had been about 80 attacks against uh, uh, American bases over the course of more than two years. In six weeks, 62 attacks. We're just going to count on luck. Yeah. And we got five dead already. More. I mean, Trita, they say it was a training accident. Maybe it was. Or maybe it was and deniable maybe it forces. We don't but, know. There's some mysterious circumstances. Yeah, either there, way, it's still five is, five KIA right there, or sort of. Exactly. KIA. Yeah. Um, but, and but then the no, especially did, though, the only thing that can the only thing that can stop this, stop these attacks against U.S. bases and troops, is a ceasefire. And we are risking a regional war for objectives and achievements in Gaza that cannot be defined, probably cannot be achieved. And it really raises the question, why, for what? Yeah, well, listen, um, this is along the lines of your previous work and, and going back into the deeper context here, but I think it's so important. I cite you all the time and I, I just like to hear you tell me I remember this right, and I'd like the audience to hear you explain how this could possibly be right compared to what we think we know, Trita, that Israel and revolutionary Shiite Iran, fundamentalist Iran under the control of the meaner old Ayatollah Khomeini, remain friends after the revolution of 79 and the hostage taking of the Americans and the uh, burning of our flag and we're the great Satan in America and Iran being eternal Cold War enemies ever since then. But Israel kept getting along with them after that, you say, in Treacherous Alliance until the year 1993, which proves lots of different things, including Israel can get along with Iran, right? Certainly. Uh, now, obviously, they weren't best friends or anything like that. But because of the um, common interest they had back then due to the geopolitical circumstances, which was that both of them saw a major threat in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, as well as from the Soviet Union, two key factors that had pushed Israel and Iran closer to each other during the time of the Shah. Those factors remained in some ways from the Iranian perspective the relationship with Israel became even more important because now uh, after the hostage crisis, Iran was on bad terms with both superpowers. It was at war with Iraq. It needed weapons. And guess what? The only country that really stepped up to provide the Iranians with those weapons. And I'm talking about the, the Iranians under the terms of Ayatollah Khomeini. Israel helped Iran get all of those weapons because it made sense for the Israelis to make sure that Iran would not lose the war against Iraq setting aside all of these different things of ideology, etc., setting aside that it's during this period that the Iranians helped create Hezbollah in Lebanon. So the idea that these ideological factors is driving this just simply doesn't have a lot of evidence in, in the history. On the contrary, we have seen that the Israelis um, have dealt with all kinds of actors at various times, um, including Hamas. Incidentally, the Israelis were part of helping create Hamas back in 1987 
as part of an effort to weaken the PLO, because back then the Israelis viewed Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian Liberation Organization as a bigger problem, and they wanted to create splits within the Palestinians. So they mm -hmm. helped groom and uh, put together Hamas, an Islamic fundamentalist organization coming out of the Egyptian Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Hang on just one second. Hey, y'all, the audiobook of my book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism, is finally done. Yes, of course, read by me. It's available at Audible, Amazon, Apple Books, and soon on Google Play and whatever other options there are out there. It's my history of America's war on terrorism from 1979 through today. Give it a listen and see if you agree. It's time to just come home. Enough already. Time to end the war on terrorism. The audiobook. Hey guys, I've had a lot of great webmasters over the years, but the team at ExpandDesigns.com have by far been the most competent and reliable. Harley Abbott and his team have made great sites for the show and the Institute, and they keep them running well, suggesting and making improvements all along. Make a deal with ExpandDesigns.com for your new business or news site. They will take care of you. Use the promo code SCOTT and save $500. That's ExpandDesigns.com. Man, I wish I was in school so I could drop out and sign up for Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom instead. Tom has done such a great job on putting together a classical curriculum for everyone from junior high schoolers on up through the postgraduate level. And it's all very reasonably priced. Just make sure you click through from the link in the right margin at scotthorton.org. Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. Real history. Real economics. Real education. Well, and, you know, Trita, especially that example that you cite there about even while everything is going on in Lebanon, where Israel is fighting against the Shiites and particularly Hezbollah and Iran is backing them and nurturing them as sort of the rise of Iran's 51st state over there in southern Lebanon and Israel still dealing with them. And just because, hey, interest and these things are complicated in all sorts of different shades of dark gray, every bit of this story, which just goes to show that all of the rhetoric, and this is what I love about that book, everybody, you got to read Treacherous Alliance, okay? Because what it does is it shows you this whole story of America, Israel, and Iran with the poor Iraqis, the godforsaken Iraqis stuck in the middle, and all of this back and forth, but it's, it's all told from the point of view of the highest level strategists and thinkers on each side. None of this day-to-day -day news cycle crap is in there. And when you look at it from that angle, you can see just how completely bogus and irrelevant all this news cycle stuff is. Like, for example, the complete black and white issue of Israel's relationship with Iran. And Iran, oh, they hate us. Oh, they want to kill us. Oh, we have to... When you look at the reality of the situation, it's as complicated as hell. And what you see, in fact, is Israeli Jews and Iranian Persian Shiite guys shaking hands and doing deals, clean ones and very dirty ones, too. All along when they need to, which means they can again Absolutely. soon, right? That's it. Absolutely. And they do constantly. I think it's important to recognize that most of the time, I would say the vast majority of the time, when we hear you can't negotiate with the other side because of X, Y, and Z, they're horrible, they have this ideology, they don't understand anything about violence. What it actually signals is your own lack of desire to negotiate rather than an actual obstacle, political, ideological, strategic to negotiations. Just look what happened yesterday. There you know, was an announcement of a peace uh, of a, a prisoner swap between Hamas and Israel brokered, not by the United States, as some media has reported, but rather by Qatar and Egypt. Those negotiations have been going on for several weeks. In fact, they started almost immediately after October 7th. Mm -hmm. So if you can negotiate that, you can negotiate a lot of other things. Hey, and Whether everybody, isn't that exactly what I said? Or not, I'm sorry to interrupt, but right? isn't that exactly what I said, everybody? Immediately was get Egypt in there to negotiate. It's exactly. the first thing I Absolutely. said. Absolutely, and, and this happens all the time. And, 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 and it's a major disfavor that a lot of folks in the media, a lot of folks in government allow this mythology to spread that negotiations are so difficult. And it's it's so, you know, there's almost perfect constellation that needs to exist in order for there to be a possibility for negotiations. That's simply not true. That's not to say that negotiations always succeed. It's not to say that there aren't times and circumstances that are better or worse 
for negotiations. But that's not usually what is being invoked. What is being invoked is that the other side is evil. The other side be belief system is incompatible with ours. And as a result, we cannot negotiate. That simply is not true. And we should be very happy that it's not true. Because if it was true, guess what? We would be at war all the time. Right. Well, and we are. But we don't have to be, for sure. And, hey, look, it's one big planet and we're all stuck on it together. So either Earth is big enough for Western civilization and Islamic civilization, as divided as we all are uh, anyway, or not so. And it's got to be, because what's the other alternative? There is no alternative, uh, no acceptable one. Um, so let me ask you this now, Trita, because, man, this is like the equivalent of 10,000 suicide bombs went off on each side, and, and the climbing down of the level of hatred and fear and feeling of emergency and resentment and everything. I mean, God, what the poor people of the Gaza Strip are going through right now is just unbelievable. And and somehow everybody's got to put even these feelings aside sometime relatively soon and figure out a new way forward. Do you have in mind, you know, some kind of vision of a positive way forward, even from here? Say if everybody had a chance to take a breath after the ceasefire and assess what the hell are we going to do now let's say maybe someone wise er were to replace benjamin netanyahu as prime minister and somebody who is certainly just more reasonable than someone as ideological as him uh someone to work with on that and and then i don't know the situation in gaza i'll let you speculate whatever you want about that but i mean just tell me what you think well, I think in the short term, the only thing that can and must be achieved is a ceasefire. But with the ceasefire comes additional diplomacy that can open up the pathway for other things. I think still in the short term, we're not going to be able to see any meaningful process. Uh, but a ceasefire in and of itself is extremely valuable because it saves lives on both sides. And incidentally, the more children are being killed or taken hostage, the further away we will be from peace in the long run. So it is upon us um, to end this fighting as soon as possible in order to maximize the chances of being able to get back into a real process. However, here's the, the bright spot, I would say. I think it's going to be impossible once we have achieved a peace process for there to, well, impossible may be too strong a word, but it will be very, I'm very skeptical that there will be a return to the old formula after a ceasefire and the old formula is the one that we have had for the last 15 or so years in the last seven years explicit and that is we're actually not trying to get a two-state solution we're actually not even trying to get peace through the abram accords we wanted to make uh, we wanted to move beyond the palestinian issue and just integrate israel into uh the well you're being very economy. generous by we you mean benjamin netanyahu's doctrine was here right well, now I'm talking about the United States as well. The United States has since the Trump years um, explicitly moved towards the, the Netanyahu plan, which is just to move beyond the Palestinians, celebrating direct flights between Tel Aviv and um, uh, Dubai as if that's a sign of peace um, and claiming peace because two countries that were never at war with each other normalized relations. Remember how all of that was celebrated. Remember how the Biden administration did not change that at all. In fact, they doubled down on it because they were trying to get an even bigger prize, which was to get normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel at the expense of the Israeli at the of the Palestinians, while at the same time even considering offering the Saudis defense uh, uh, guarantees, security guarantees, which would, which would mean that the United States would send troops, U.S. servicemen and women, to die for the house of Saud. All of that was being done. We were completely neglecting the Palestinians. And I think it's impossible to return to that formula. There's going to have to be something that addresses uh, the plight of the Palestinians, the fact that they continue to live under um, uh, occupation. And that political will did not exist prior to all of this, these atrocities. I find it difficult to see a serious effort being mustered that doesn't actually try to address it. Will it address it sufficiently? Will it be doing more than just throwing breadcrumbs at it? Hopefully it will do much, much more than that. But if you had asked me in uh, 
late September of this year, did I see any prospect of the United States, Europe and other parties getting serious about the Palestinian issue? I would have told you no. Now I think actually it may happen, but it's not going to happen in the short term. Yeah. Well, I mean, even uh, as far as Netanyahu goes, I mean, it makes so much sense for him to keep the war going as long as he can so he can stay in office. But it seems also that, like uh, I've made the comparison before, that you know, W. Bush had only been in office for eight months. Trita, how could anyone have expected him to do his job as leader of the security force by that short amount of time? And so he was given total grace for September 11th. Got a 90% approval rating out of it. But it seems like if it had been Bill Clinton's third term, boy, he'd have been in trouble for that because everyone would have known that this was his fault one way or another, you know? Um, yeah. It would have been that much clearer. And boy, Netanyahu's in, however you want to count it, something like his fifth term if we were counting American presidencies here. Uh, and so at the end of the Netanyahu doctrine, this whole thing is just in his lap. And so... It seems like, uh, you know, like Churchill after the end of World War II, he's going to be right out at the end of this thing if it ever comes. Definitely. No one is expecting him to survive this. And it has created speculation, perhaps some evidence as well, that this likely will mean that he will try to keep the conflict going as long as possible. Perhaps not at this intense level, but at a level that at least makes sure that it goes on, it doesn't come to conclusion because the minute it comes to a conclusion, that's probably when his political career finally also comes to a conclusion. Yeah. Well, and I don't mean to spin it like uh, Bernie, uh, sorry, Benny Gantz is any kind of hero or anything. Certainly I know Naftali Bennett, who was recently the prime minister, Yair Lapid, these guys are very ideological, especially Bennett. But like Benny Gantz is a former general and so he's soaked in blood, but he's more of a professional, dispassionate type in a sense, more of a technocrat than a Likudnik, right? So th there's like a yeah, possibility. I would, I would be Go careful. I, I think what we've seen in Israel over the course of the last decade and during the reign of Netanyahu, which is that, you know, there's been a significant radicalization of um, uh, the Israeli society. And certainly Hamas's attack has further contributed to that. So I would be careful to pin too much hope to the idea that as soon as this or that specific leader is out, there will be a significant change. Now, that's not to say that I don't think it would be quite welcome to see Netanyahu finally step aside. Um, but well, not, yeah, I, I was I only going to say it raised not. the possibility. I wasn't going to go any further yeah. than that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, my point being, look, there, there, there's structural factors here uh, that is going to make it more difficult to be able to um, see the type of a change that I think is needed. So even without Netanyahu there, um, we're still going to be dealing with a very, very significant problem in radicalization of Israeli society, as well as radicalization of the Palestinians. Um, and this is, again, part of the reason why the longer we allow this to happen, the worse the situation gets. Yeah. Um, well, now, so I know you said that you got to go to the White House for a briefing and this and that. So that reminds me that you're in D.C. and you do have your thumb on the pulse of things. And I think probably know Democrats a little better than Republicans when it comes to that. So what do you think about the atmosphere there, the level of patience or fed upness among anyone who matters? I, I've never seen something like this amongst the Democrats. There is um, an extreme level of anger and disappointment and disillusionment with the manner in which the Biden administration has handled this, the manner in which it has treated other Democrats, uh, the manner in which Biden has just completely gone in the direction of giving a, a standing carte blanche to, to the Netanyahu government. And when you read things such as what is said in the um, in political yesterday, where it said that one of the concerns that the Biden administration had about a ceasefire, including um, a prisoner swap, is that the pause would allow journalists to get into Gaza and be able to better cover the carnage that is taking place there. And that would have a more detrimental effect on US public opinion on the war in a manner that the Biden administration found apparently problematic. Yeah. 
So the Biden administration has a clear understanding of how bad the situation is. That's not the problem. The problem is if American public finds out about how bad the situation is. Mm -hmm. When you read this, not in, you know, this is not in antiwar.com or, um, you know, um, uh, a fringe outlet. This is political, which, you know, in, you know, many would say actually has a, um, uh, given its German owners uh, rules that they've set up in Germany, at least for it, in which you have to sign um, a pledge uh, to Israel's security in order to be able to work uh, at least for the mother company of political, you know, this was reported in political. And of course, Democrats know this because they have ha have their conversations with the administration. It, it leaves uh, a tremendous um, um, uh, challenge for many of these Democrats to be able to continue to deal with the Biden administration, given these um, decisions that they've made and the manner in which they have handled this conflict and how they have handled uh, those in the Democratic Party who have objected. And I think it's also important to note that the Democrats, by and large, have been quite uh, disinclined or even intimidated to criticize Biden on a whole set of different issues out of fear that that some way somehow is going to be beneficial to Trump or to the Republicans. We saw, for instance, how they sent a very benign letter last August um, supporting Biden in, in, in Ukraine, but asking for a diplomatic strategy to complement um, uh, his policy. And it created an uproar. And within 24 hours, they withdrew the letter. And I think what you're seeing here is a lot of pent up anger at the Biden administration because they have not been listened to, they have not been heard. And, and when they have spoken out, they have been um, uh, punished, not necessarily by Biden himself, but by others in the Democratic Party. So now that dam has broken, that dam has been quite powerful. It's not just an anger over how they're handling uh, Gaza, I think. It, it goes deeper than that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's certainly on the entire left half of the American political spectrum, you have the left half of that is 100% against this. And more and more of the liberals and the progressives, as you get closer to the center there, also agree but the commanders of the Democratic Party, boy, they're all Bill Clinton on this, and they don't want to budge one bit. So that's going to be a hell of a fight for the rest of this year. And then importantly, hugely, you know, the first poll I saw said 56, and that sounded a little hopeful. But another one said, very recent poll, 50% of American Republicans want to cease fire here. Wow. So how many percent? Five zero. Mm, want a mm. ceasefire, which, come on, man, for the Republicans, we might yeah. as well celebrate that like it's 75 as far as what an advance <laughs> that is. That's look, that's half of Republicans criticizing Biden, not for being weak and not killing enough people, but instead yeah. because they want an end to this. That's huge. And I don't know if Absolutely. I know it's not as severe a split as it is on the Democratic left and all of that. But to have that sentiment among the America firsters that even when it's Israel, they kind of remember how they felt about Ukraine a year ago and they don't really feel like flip flopping that bad right now. Thank you very much. As broke as we all are, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, it's a no, huge crack up I think on both sides. In some ways it's even more, in some ways I would say it's even more um, 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 significant than what you're seeing on the left. The, the position on the left is um fits an old pattern um the only reason we haven't seen that pattern more is because of the hyper partisan atmosphere in washington but now the pattern has come back but it was supposed to be there all the time because that right. tension has been there and has been growing right the fact that what is surprising the bigger break is that we're seeing it also happening to a certain extent on the right and i think it, again a main factor perhaps not the only one is uh, I think the realization amongst a lot of folks on the right that this actually could drag the United States into a war. And if you don't want to get the United States into another war, then it doesn't matter if that war is because of Ukraine or because of Israel. You just don't want to be in another war, period. Yeah. yeah. And especially when, as you mentioned, the threat is of Iraq War Four. That's what we're at risk of getting into right now because of what Israel's doing in Gaza, which... If you lost your son or your brother or your leg in Iraq War 2 II or 3 or 1, but especially 2 or 3, you might be ready to not go back there anymore now. You know, be sick and yeah. damn tired of it for real.
Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah man. So listen, um, I always appreciate your insight. I cannot recommend Treacherous Alliance highly enough. It's one of the best books I ever read on any of this stuff. And uh, I absolutely love the Quincy Institute and all the great work that you're doing there. So thank you right for all that. You. And thanks so much, Scott. For your time again. Appreciate you, man. Talk to you soon. Bye. All right, y'all. And that is Trita Parsi again at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. That's responsiblestatecraft.com. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.